end. So we're disconnecting the focuser, disconnecting the camera, and then let's close Nina. Thank you so much to the people who put Nina together. Now let's open up uh, SharpCap. And in SharpCap, we'll connect to our camera, which is a ZWO ASI 2600 MC Pro. And that camera is out there uh, mounted to the scope. And I'm going to connect to the live stream with my phone so I can see what you're seeing. Uh, I want to make sure the audio is good. Um, there's the channel. Yeah, the audio seems to be coming through. So um, let's see. There's our, our image from the ASI 2600. Now let's open up another instance of SharpCap. And in this second instance of SharpCap, we'll put the ASI 178, which is mounted on top of the scope with the all sky camera. And that enables us to see kind of what the uh, scope is seeing. It's almost like, not quite, but it's almost like um, an electronic viewfinder. I don't know what time to use for this. Let's try four seconds and see what that looks like. There we go. That's like as bright as daylight with that moon, isn't it? But you can see a good amount of stars. Let's try that at three seconds. Welcome. If you were on the live stream, be sure and uh, say hello and tell us where you're from. And maybe uh, let us know you're watching. That's a little bit better, isn't it? It's still maybe just a little bit bright. So let's drop down to two seconds to see what that looks like. There's Frank. Frank, you amaze me. Do you have to work tomorrow? <laughs> Don't you? There, that's a little bit better night view. Boy, look at that bright sun up there at the top. Oh, rats. Never mind. That's not the sun. That's the moon. But it looks like the sun, doesn't it? Uh, we have several others, about a half dozen others that have logged in, in spite of the fact that it's 11 p.m. at night. Uh, so we've got our um, live stream. We've got our camera view from the ASI 2600, which is watching what's happening through the telescope. And if you look down there on your lower right hand corner, uh, you can probably see that scope down there. And what we're doing is we're looking kind of uh, as if you were aiming a rifle and we're looking down the barrel. Uh, that's what we're doing here. If you can see, we're looking down from the backside, we're looking down the barrel of the like you'd look on the rifle sights of a rifle and that way we can see over the top of the telescope and see pretty much what the the telescope is seeing as you look down there on the right. That is an 11 inch Rasa. It's mounted on a an Ioptron CEM70G mount. Uh, the mount is the thing that sits on the tripod that points the telescope if you're new to astronomy. Uh, yeah, Frank, we've we've had another clear night tonight. Now, I got to tell you, after tonight, I think we had a couple of days of snow, and that's why I hurried up and did this tonight. It's going to be the, the last clear night in probably seven days. So part of it is just that I jump into action when it's clear. That's part of it. But you're saying that it's been weeks since you've had a clear night, so I feel bad. Anyway, down there... Uh, the other thing that's interesting is the scope is out there in the meadow. It's out there in the grass, about 220 feet from where we are. And tonight, gang, is the first time that we've ever used a uh, fiber optic cable. Let me see if I can get the camera over here and show you this uh, Icron USB Raven 3124. Now, we've been using a 3104 for some time. And the 3104, uh, it brings the signal in from the telescope via uh, Cat7 cable, kind of like you might have in your office for networking cable. But not so with the 3124. It uses fiber optic cables. So I don't know if you can see back there in the back. This is actually fiber optic cable that's coming in now from the scope. And there's another unit just like this outside. Uh, it's over, it's at the base of the scope in a little uh, weatherproof box there. And uh, another thing that we've done tonight is we've 
uh, set up a rig runner power distribution box. And I wonder if I could actually show you that. Let's see. Let me just, how about if I open up a, a, just a file folder here on um, this. And uh, I'm just going to zoom down here real quick and show you a picture of that. It is right here. I just snapped this picture so we'd be able to look at this. This is the um, Rig Runner 4005i. And it's set up to distribute the power. And we've got these uh, Anderson power poles in back now, much more dependable power connections. And it measures the exact amperage that's going through its circuitry real time. And so when the power is entering, it was right around 13.9 volts at uh, 2.16 amps on the circuit that was going through. So we're kind of excited to try out this rig runner tonight. And I hope that it'll give us a much better, um, uh, d more dependable power supply. Once again, if you're looking at the the stream tonight and you haven't said hello and where you're from, we'd like to invite you to do that. Uh, <clears throat> let's see where I told you we're from. We're uh, broadcasting from the outskirts of Louisville, Kentucky, where our sky is about a Bortle uh, 6, Bortle 5, Bortle 6 usually. But tonight it is graced by this beautiful moon. Uh, so that's just something we're going to have to contend with, and it's just part of the adventure. Let's open up our planetarium software. For planetarium software now, we're using Starry Night Pro, and it's kind of the counterpart for Sky Safari if you're used to using Sky Safari on your phone. Starry Night Pro would be the, the Windows equivalent, so to speak, except it's kind of its own program. Uh, Starry Night Pro probably kicked things off maybe in 1996 or so, somewhere around there, so it's a very mature program, uh, 25 years or so. It's been at work. And the other night, we were exploring uh, targets from the Messier list just to kind of get back familiar with the Messier list. So that's one thing we'd like to do uh, tonight. And let's just warm up with a few of those targets. Uh, we want to make our new session, a uh, new observing session. So let's see. I think the other night it was... 44. So let's make it 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 45. So 45 observing nights. And we'll call this live EAA. And we'll say with fiber optic, fiber optic cable, something like that. And for the site, we'll say Emerald Hills. And for the date, it's got it filled in incorrectly there. Well, that tells us that our date is wrong for Starry Night Pro. So before we do this, let's set our date correctly. Um, look at that. So how do we do that now? How about that? There we go. Now let's go to um, start a new session. And... Um, once again, it's 0045 uh, EAA via fiber and a rig runner. And it's got the correct date now. I think it'll work out the end date okay, but let me just put uh, for the time, let's put... Um, the 14th, and we'll just say something like 3 a.m., something like that. And so there's the session. And the other night, it seems like we made it to M40. Boy, I can't remember where we were, Frank. You might remember. Uh, was it 47? Let's show info there and see if we have an observation. Yep, we made it to 47. But I don't think we made it to 50, did we? Let's, whoops. How did that do that? Image editor. That's not what we want. 50. I must have just hit the thing. Show info. Uh, right. So somewhere between 47 and 50. How about 48? 
There we are. We're ready for M48, I think. And it does look like it's up. Um, so tell you what let's do then. Let's start with M48. But before we do that, let's go up here to view the telescope setup. And let's uh, connect. OK, so we're connected. Now let's go to um, telescope control. And I've been trying out this follow scope. Kind of like that because whatever the scope is looking at, we look at in the um, planetarium. So let's try that first. You notice tonight we did uh, remember to engage our uh, tracking. Kim, I can't believe you're on down there. Uh, what is it? Noon. in uh, It's a 12 minutes after noon, right, in Australia, where you are? That's crazy. Uh, but we are, we're glad to have you aboard, Kim, and we're looking forward to having you here, especially because we're hoping you can help us with this asteroid in a minute. Um, so now that we're connected, oh, the other thing let's do is let's look over in SharpCap. Are we connected to the mount in SharpCap? I think we are. Let's look at our hardware. What did I just do? Settings. Let's look at our hardware and make sure that's connected correctly. Got the Celestron focuser and the mount. Yes, we're connected. So now let's, um, let's go here to um, M48 and let's try to slew there. This is our first target. So now you'll want to um, look at our scope as it slews and there's the scope so you can see it's making its way another thing we can do in a second is look at the um, the um, view through the ASI 178 this is actually kind of a good view of the scope. It lets you see this black dew shield on the front. And now we're kind of peering down the mouth of the scope. And down inside the, the mouth of that dew shield is our ASI 2600 camera mounted to the front of the telescope. So there's no eyepiece on this telescope. Here's where the 178 is. You can barely see the dew shield around it. I mean the dew strap around it. And up here on top are our... Um, our power, by the way, we don't have that connected yet. Let's go connect the pocket power box. And let's also connect the control hub. And that way we can get, um, hopefully, real-time reports. Hmm, let's see. The power box is telling us, let's see, how do we connect here? Right here? The power box is telling us that we have 12.8 volts, well now 13, depends on when the dew strap connects. We have about 13 volts that is getting to this these accessories. You can see our dew heaters here. Uh, they're on automatic, so they calculate with the temperature being 33.6 Fahrenheit and the relative humidity 89%. Uh, they've ca the, the dew the dew channels have calculated uh, that the dew point will be about 30.7 degrees. So they're already working intermittently to help us uh, be able to um, avert the collection of dew on, the, on our cameras. So that's kind of what we can see there. And I wonder why this is not connected. Hmm. Seems odd, doesn't it? Oh, there we go. Just hadn't felt my click yet of my mouse. And now you can see, uh, we'll, we'll see a report now of the voltage flowing through the USB uh, channels. You now, remember, what we've got these set to do is they bring up all this stuff even if we don't have these little uh, dashboards pulled up because they remember the last settings that you had them set on. And even if we don't pull them up, uh, they wake up with these settings already remembered. So that's kind of handy. So Kim tells us it's 245 down in Australia. That's a little bit 
later than I thought. Well, Kim, we are so glad that you joined us. Uh, kind of makes us feel like we've got the other side of the planet live here. Well, we do. Uh, okay, so now let's go back to, um, oh, this is a missing Messier object. So let's look at our planetarium software first, because look at, this is all we're going to see. It's basically observers were unable to find any object at the coordinates that Messier entered for this object in his catalog. And it's now believed that he made a mistake in calculating his celestial coordinates. It's kind of like uh, the unfinished symphony from some composer. Uh, this cluster is a loose, uh, the, the, we now think that the object he might have observed is the open cluster NGC 2548. And we'll have to look here and see where is NGC 2548. Here's 2583 and 2586, but I don't uh, see 2548 yet, but it's probably around here somewhere, huh? Um, this cluster is a loose collection of around 80 stars visible to the unaided eyes and best seen in binoculars. So basically what we're trying to do is piece together what Charles Messier was looking at, and this is a unique situation because in this case we have his records but we don't know what is what cluster he was viewing so let's go over in our in our actual real-time camera and that would be right here and you can see uh, there's nothing that we're seeing here so what we're going to do is we're going to put m48 in our uh, title here and then we're going to try uh, doing a, um, a plate solve to this area. Now you might wonder, why are we plate solving to something that Messier didn't find? Well, it's because our telescope mount was given an assignment. And it was given our assignment to go to this place. But this is the first target of the night. And you can see up there, I don't know if you can read that tiny print, it's 2.12 degrees off. Because why? Well, because uh, the first target of the night, the mount is kind of matching up. Whoops, I see what you mean, Frank. Thanks. I had um, I had put you guys on the mount. Let's get back to the, the screen. Thank you so much, Frank. Uh, what we're doing now is we plate solve to this location so that the mount can talk to the computer and they can get on the same page together so we can really truly view with the pointing of the mount what we wanted to view when the computer says to point there. So what we're going to do now is we're going to just uh, enter a, um, an observation here. We're just going to say associated with our list uh, no, I'm sorry, associated with our, oh, we're already on our uh, session 45. We're going to say, so this is Messier's missing object. Uh, you know, uh, to make just one mistake out of 110 objects is actually good odds. Keep in mind, he was viewing from the top of a hotel in downtown Paris, uh, France. And the fact that he might have only made one mistake out of all that, this is a nice concentration of stars here, but it probably wouldn't normally merit having its own Messier object. Huh. So um, we won't stay on this long, but I'll just grab a quick snapshot so that we have a record of this in our, in our notes for tonight. Let's go over for a second to uh, the 178 camera, which is, again, the one that's riding on top of the scope. And as you can see, it is totally blown out now by the moon. We're close enough to the moon that the moon is just completely distracting everything that this camera might see. But through, even through the distraction, I don't know if you can see, we can still make out Orion here, see the three belt stars of Orion and the two shoulders and the feet and here's the sword. So you can kind of see the part of the sky that we're looking at with this 178. You can also see down here 
This is our building, the building I'm in. And that window there is the, the, the window that I'm in. Right now, I'm going to go turn off the lights. That way, you can see what I mean. So for just a moment, we'll turn off. We just turned off the lights in that room. And you can see how the lights went dark there. So that's the office where we are right now. And look, there's a fire hydrant on this side of the road <laughs> where the telescope is. So that's kind of fun to see the building that I'm in through this 178 uh, camera. Um, I'm going to turn the lights back on just so I don't uh, trip over something here in a second. <laughs> um, now let's go back to the planetarium software and so this became our first target of the night, M48. Why don't we go to M49 now? M49, we'll slew there. You notice that Messier didn't necessarily do these in any kind of um, latitude order, you know, right ascension, so to speak, or declination. Instead, he, um, he did these pretty much in the order that he observed them. Now, you can see that in our planetarium software, we graze through the trees. Let's go back to our 178. We're kind of low, but we might be able to get that. Again, there's the window of the building I'm in. You can see the front doors there and the little canopy over the front. That's our prayer center and atrium building where I am. We're kind of low and there are some trees here. Uh, now, if we go back to our Wow, that's not looking good. It looks like we're we're definitely looking through the trees. Uh, we'll have to come back to this object. Right now, it is in the trees right here, it looks like. And in a minute, that'll rise above that tree, and we'll be good. Uh, but right now, it is not going to be good. By the way, if you look really close, you can see my there's my AC cord. And right beside it is that fiber optic cable that you can see as well. And it strings across that road there. That's kind of fun, isn't it? Down at the base, if you look very closely, let's bring our camera up a little bit now that we're not in the moon anymore. Down here at the base, you can see the little rock apron that we have, river rock apron we have around the concrete pad that we poured for the observatory. And this is the front porch of the observatory, and there's the pad that the observatory is going to sit in. So the scope is actually sitting in approximately the same spot where the pier will be holding it. The pier is the column upon which the telescope will set inside the observatory. So we have the telescope more or less in the very same spot where that pier will be holding it. You can see that river rock next to us, and that's kind of the front porch of where that observatory will be. So that's kind of fun. Uh, Let's go back at our, yeah, it's just not quite the right time to observe this object so far. So let's remember that. Um, minimize the window in front of Starry Night Pro. And let's go back to our planetarium software. And instead of M49, now let's go to M50 and see if we can get to it. So once again, we'll put... Um, there's the scope whizzing around. Does that make you dizzy? To You're riding on top of the scope. It's kind of like you're on a Bronco uh, because you're able to see from the bird's eye view of the 178 camera. And uh, as the scope turns, you're able to see, you're able to look at what it's seeing. There on the lower right-hand side, you can see the scope moving. And look at the counterweights here can see the counterweights and there's the scope it looks like it's come to a resting position oh look you can see my truck now in this view let's uh, darken the <laughs> you're getting a, all kinds of tour here that's my truck there in the in the corner parked there on the road you can see it's it's set up so it's right under the the, the line of those trees uh, that's where I unload everything okay now let's go back to the planetarium software and minimize the window in front of the planetarium software. So now we're looking at um, trying to grab that corner and make this window a little bit bigger. 
There, we finally got it. Um, so what was this? Was this M50, right? So let's just quickly look at the info for that. M50 is an open cluster of about 200 stars, which may be glimpsed with unaided eye and dark skies. We don't have those tonight. The moon is... Hey, Doug, what lens is the is on the 178? It is, Kim, it is that lens that comes with the 178 in the box. It's like an all... It's like a wide-angle lens that comes with it. I think it's like 150-degree view, and it's meant to be a wide-angle sky lens, and they pack it with the 178 for free. Um... What is our moon? Let's tell you what let's do. Let's go over to our browser for a second. Let's find our browser. And let's open up the, um, what is it called? Um, Clear Outside is the app I like to use. And uh, it says the moon is at 87%. So that's a pretty good sized moon, isn't it? 87%. Pretty bright. Let's go back over to Sharp Cap. We're out of the trees now. And let's do another plate solve just to add this. Um, thank you for asking, Kim. Just to add this, uh, what would you call it? Like this um, calculation, you know, this calibration to the mount so that it can. Uh, Assemble this model. We were about oh, just three hundredths of a degree off. So it's pretty happy now with the model, and that is that open cluster there in the middle. It did make that three hundredths of a degree change. So you can see for a second how the scar the stars jumped. Now we really don't need to do much uh, live stacking here, do we? Uh, we could zoom in just a little bit so that we can see a little bit more of this cluster. And you can see that it appears as a patch of diffuse light set against the fainter star-rich field of the Milky Way. Careful observation reveals a myriad of star patterns, including chains formed by the cluster's brighter blue stars. That's interesting. So here's the, the view we should be seeing. Look at those chains. That is interesting, isn't it? Let's go back now and see if we can find something. Oh, look, here's one of those chains. And here's another one. That is interesting, isn't it? So remember that M50 is the cluster that has chains. Zuo calls it the all-sky lens. I used it last month to capture the Geminids. Wow. So you did a meteor shower watch with your... You have a 178 also. How about that? That's awesome. Okay, so we're going to do a, a an observation here of 150... And we're going to say um, we indeed could see those chains of the brighter blue stars. Brighter blue stars. Um, you know, we might just say a word about this, these blue stars. When we look at an open cluster sometimes, we can see blue stars there and look you can see them pretty plainly in our planetarium software let's go back over here i think we would have to live stack just a little bit to see them here so let's let's um let's do switch to our imaging and we might back this exposure off because 20 seconds is going to reveal a lot. But let's just see if we can get some color, a little bit more color, tease a little more color out of this by going with a little longer explosion, explosion, exposure. Uh, there we go. We're starting to see some color. And as we live stack this, Let's um, let's do a color balance and 
pull that black level over to about there and then now we're starting to see some color hopefully we'll see just a little more color come through as we get a couple more frames I wonder if our auto balance dialed down the blue a little bit on purpose because it detected so much blue in the exposure in the ex, in the exposure. The other thing to remember is I am a little bit color deficient. <laughs> so Kim says that's it. Zwolso sells. Oh, is that right? A 2.8 to 12 millimeter CS lens which provides a tighter field of view. Some people are using these as electronic finder scopes. I did not know that. So it's 2.8 to 12 millimeter. So 2.8, I bet that's the focal ratio, right? And 12 millimeter is the, the focal length. CS. Cloudy skies. I don't know what that stands for. Somebody with better color vision, are you seeing a little bit more blue in this image now? Not a lot. CS is focal length. 12 millimeter focal length. But I wonder what the CS stands for. Ah, now we're starting to see some of these blue. Look at some of these blue stars starting to pop out. Now we might say a word about these. My understanding is that in the globular clusters, you see a lot of these uh, orangish, and yellowish and reddish stars because the clusters are older and the globular clusters are kind of the grandfathers you know the all the all the young stars have long since been I guess pulled away and all that we have left are these gravitationally bound tight uh, yellowish reddish stars on these younger open clusters the blue Straggler stars are still, you know, kind of, um, Frank says, yes, slightly blue, are still kind of orbiting through this open cluster, being strewn in all different directions. And as they pass different galaxies, they'll apparently be trapped and pulled apart even more. Uh, the open cluster doesn't have as much, uh, it, it's newer. And we, we feel like that these stars were mostly all born together. So, we don't have a lot of older stars in most of these open clusters. By the way, I'm going to save the live stock as is now because I just remembered, in honor of Frank, I actually shot flats um, the other night, but I just wondered, I'm going to stop this live stock for a second. Let's go look and see if they attached here under pre-processed, no under image controls, right? No, here, subtract dark. Um, do I have to pick? And then subtract and then apply flat. Oh, look, it didn't find it. That's just so not fun. Why didn't it find it? Oh, but look, it looks like it's uh, it's teed it up for me there. 22112. So we just applied those. Okay, now once I've applied those guys, those will stick, right? Maybe if I go up here and say, save that to the default camera profile. Now I hope they'll stick. What is CCS mount lens? A C mount is a type of lens mount commonly found on CCTV cameras. How interesting. Uh, this is brand new for me, Kim. Thanks a lot for... All right, so did we do our... Yes, we already did an observation of this, right? So minimize the... We did our observation of N50, correct? Let's just check real quick. Uh, show info, yes. 
Now let's go to M51, slew to M51. And uh, while we're slewing, we just might say a word about EAA, Electronically Assisted Astronomy. In case you're watching this live, I see we've got over a dozen now watching live and welcome to everybody. Uh, I don't see how you guys are doing this in the middle of the night. Papa Tech is there. Welcome, Papa Tech. From down there in Florida, you're staying up late. Um, I don't know who all the other folks are, but feel free to check in and tell us where you're from. Or you could be watching this uh, long after uh, the live uh, broadcast as a recording. And welcome either way. We're glad to have you. Wow, this is, M51 is a very recognizable uh, site, isn't it? This is the Whirlpool Galaxy. And uh, M51 is something worth memorizing. Look at the way these uh, arms, we're going to hopefully see these arms strolling out here and look at these dust lanes in the arms. Look at how this smaller galaxy, which is identified here as, uh, sometimes you see it identified as M51, what, A or something. Here they've got uh, a, I guess they've got identified as NGC 5195 separately. Look how NGC 5195 is interacting with, gravitationally, M51. So let's open up our information window here. So that'll be open. And now let's go over to our 178 lens and take a look at where we're looking. So this should be live. This is live now looking through the, the 178, which is the lens that Kim is talking about. It's kind of a, a lens on top of the scope. And look what you might see here. If Let me brighten this up just a little bit for you. Put that on two seconds since the moon is now kind of behind us as we look. Look at the Big Dipper. See the two pointer stars and there's the North Star. You can't quite make up the Little Dipper, Ursa Minor, but you can make out the main stars of the Big Dipper, can't you? So our, our uh, M51 is somewhere right here. Let's go over now to the main camera we have, which is the ASI. 2600 and first thing I want to check before we do anything else is just do one more sync uh, by plate solving and that way we'll make sure you know what we're still we're still at our old um, exposure when it comes to oh the plate solving must not use that it found just a 300 degree correction but we'll we'll go ahead and add that to the model of the mount so that It'll be that much more efficient. We're on the slower frame. I forgot to set it on the quicker. Wow, Green Cat, it's nice to have you. 4.40 a.m. in Manchester. Okay, we have to ask you, Green Cat, are you city or united? We're going to find out if you follow Manchester City or Manchester United. And that'll tell us something about how happy of a season you're having. Jim is on. Doug, could you speak about the change to fiber and what it has gained your setup? Jim from South Dakota. Good to have you on board, Jim. You bet. We'll certainly do that. Um, let's go ahead and start our live stack here. I think we're ready to do that. Let's back off to auto for a second and start live stacking and clear the live stack. That would have all happened automatically if I would have used the... the um, little sequence that we have now in, in uh, sharp cap. So we'll, we'll do that next time. Lord willing, we'll remember that. Uh, so what does fiber gain us? Well, the first reason we had to move to fiber is because of code here in Louisville, Kentucky. You can't bury a Cat7 cable in the same trench or conduit that you bury the power uh, line. Uh, why is that? Because they don't want... Uh, the power line shorting out someday against the Cat 7 and creating a fire hazard either in your building or anywhere. They don't want all that electrical shock going on, uh, making the Cat 7 cable live with 110 volts. So because we're building an observatory out in this spot where the telescope is currently situated, we had to move to fiber anyway. So 
I decided I would go in and get the Icron, uh, the Icron equipment that we would need to be able to do fiber eventually once we have the observatory. It's the USB Raven 3124, and that way I could get used to trying it out. At the time, I had no idea how easy it would be and how quick it would be to set up fiber. The second thing that fiber gains us is uh, a lot more distance. Under Cat7 cable, I believe, I don't have these memorized, but I think the distance is limited to like 100 meters maybe with Cat7 on the Raven, the 3104. On the 3124, it seems like with fiber, you can go to three times that far or something. Uh, I have been using a 200 foot Cat7 cable, which always kind of cramped our style. It always was a little bit too close. Uh, now that we switched to fiber, I went on and got a 275 foot uh, fiber cable and that lets me breathe. So now we have some, some um, breathing room. Here is actually the leftover of that uh, fiber cable. Let me see if I go if I go here and then go here, you'll see a lot closer view. This is all the fiber looks like. It's this tiny filament stuff. I mean, it's super small and very flexible, uh, lightweight. Like This is like a fraction of the size of the Cat7 cable. I am loving it. Uh, it was a lot lighter weight, a lot lighter weight to set up and it's a lot easier to work with overall. So those are a couple of things. It is um, obviously more capable of passing um, more bandwidth and more signals. For instance, tonight we are trying to run the LAN out to the mount. So, so the LAN here in our building is actually broadcasting through the fiber out to the place where the scope is. So we'll be able to put a Wi-Fi router out there for whatever reason we need to do that. And it'll actually be connected to the building via uh, Ethernet, so to speak, except it'll be coming in through fiber, which is kind of a fun idea that we don't have to run 230 feet away, try to go through a couple of walls and do Wi-Fi that far. Uh, instead, our, our things like our surveillance cameras, our, our camera that we're using to look at the scope, all that kind of thing uh, will be able to, to be seen instead uh, via the, the router out there. So Frank says, don't wind it too tight. Gotcha. Green Cat says, city. So actually, they're doing pretty well. Um, I don't have the record memorized, but weren't they like in the top five the last time I checked? They're, they're doing okay. Uh, the soccer team, Manchester City. So, Jim, I hope that answers your question. Wow, Green Cat, I can't believe you're up at 440. Do you like work days or something? I mean, work nights, and so you're at your your job, and that way you're looking at your phone while you're at your job or what? Uh, so we're stacking here. Let's do our... Actually, that color doesn't look bad. Let's put our sky right here. And now let's bring this in wonder why we're not seeing M51 in our image here. What in the world? Okay, let's go back here to our... Okay, something's up. Minimize the... One. There we are. So the planetarium software thinks that we're looking at M51. But look at our photorealistic landscape. We should be to the left of that tree. That's not bad, actually, compared to where our... I guess that's probably correct. Why aren't we seeing it in our image? You think it's just that small? Boy, that's sad, isn't it? Let's do a new color match and 
Oh, I don't like that color match. Let's bring these together. Okay, so let's let's bring our greens down a little bit. Gonna have to balance these manually because of the moon, I think. Let's bring these mids over. Why is that so ugly? Do you think this has got something to do with those flats? Because we just applied those flats. This is the first time we've city top of Premier League. They're on top. Wow, that's awesome. And that's like Harry Kane, isn't it? Uh, that's the reason why, is because of Harry Kane. You know, I guess it could be a combination of moonlight. Let's drop those greens just a bit. Is M51 this hard to image? I don't remember it being this bad. Let's look at the last time. Wow, it took forever to get our live stacking histogram tuned, partly because we're working off a new imaging train. Ah. So I had a hard time with tuning this last time. Much better color balance, messy and marathon practice. So on May 26th in 2021, this took a long time to tune as well. So I'm going to do a new observation and say, wow, once again, this was tough to image. Is this object just all that dim? That's my question. Green cat. Oh, retired, early riser. I would say GSM test, imaging IC2177 at Morning Dove Observatory in Florida. GSM test, good to have you aboard. So we're we're doing dual imaging here. That's exciting. I hope you're having more luck than I am because right now, this is not looking good. Let's do another color balance. There, it's starting to, something's starting to come in, huh? Let's bring our reds back up. Let's bring our blues up. Boy, we're having to tease this one, aren't we? Let's bring this black over to here. That's eight minutes. You're starting to see the spiral structure, aren't you? Let's blow that up a little more. This is a tough object for me tonight. Maybe it's the bright 87% moon. Manchester is terrible for clouds. Otherwise, I would be out imaging too. You know, I've actually heard that about Manchester. Why do you live there then, Green Cat? No, I'm just kidding. That's obviously your home. Well, GSM is probably doing better because down there in the warmth of Florida, maybe there's not as much moonlight. Frank says, don't wind it up too tight. Oh, that's back on the the um, fiber. Hmm. I wonder if this is because we're applying those flats and I don't have those captured correctly. Ah, there we're starting to bring in a little more, aren't we? Look at that. This is just evidently a tough object for Doug. Hmm. Let's see what the uh, planetarium software says about this. Minimize the window in front. Oh, I had it right here, uh, description. The Whirlpool Galaxy is arguably the most impressive galaxy for amateur astronomers. It is easy to locate with binoculars as it lies just over three degrees northwest of Al-Qaeda, 
the star at the end of the Big Dipper's handle. Huh. Oh, here it is. Al-Qaeda. Um, the Whirlpool is a face-on galaxy, making its spiral structure easy to observe. A telescope, dark skies, and moderate power will begin to reveal the spiral arms. M51 has a bright central core, but no stars can be resolved. The core likely contains a supermassive black hole. Of special interest is the bridge of nebulosity that connects M51 to its companion galaxy, NGC 5195. Recent research suggests that the gravitational pull of NGC 5195 is causing star formation in the Whirlpool galaxy. Okay, so let's go back over and see how we're doing here. Still not perfect. I wonder if this is partly because of the moonlight. You know what else could be happening? We could be on the edge of the treetops. Maybe, maybe, maybe. See how this area is starting to look like trees? And maybe we're right into those trees here. I bet that's what's happening. I bet there are trees here. And again, you can see that in the 178. The scope is aimed. There's the end star. Boy, I don't know if that's the end star. Let's go back here to our planetarium software and so there's the end star I bet the end star now has snuck behind that uh, landscape what's the um, what's the keystroke to make the landscape disappear is it K no or maybe I have to click on that first no. Oh, K makes constellations appear and disappear. What's hide landscape? Hide horizon. Hmm. Doesn't help us. Frank says, you're only up about 13 degrees above the horizon. Not good for galaxies. So that's part of it too. We're, we're lower, which means the telescope is you can imagine because we're shooting across the we're across the horizon, we have about double the amount of atmosphere to have to image through. So we're seeing a lot more atmosphere. Well now we're starting to see a little more galaxy. But still makes me feel bad that it's not just beautiful. 87% moon. A lot more atmosphere and possibly some tree leaves. It sounds like I'm rationalizing. Hmm. 13 degrees above the horizon. How did you know that, Frank? Are you looking over here? Position in the sky. Altitude. 20 here. But still, that's at the beginning of what is tolerable. I'm thinking there might be boy, by this view, it doesn't look like it. It looks like it's probably right here, isn't it? So it's probably just atmosphere, moonlight, Larry Fraley in the flesh. Gain is set on 100. A clear night and clouds are rolling in in Florida. Brent, welcome. It's pretty amazing that we can see anything. I just stepped out and all I can see is Orion. That's because of that 87% moonlight, huh? Larry, you're in Phoenix. Are you imaging with your Stellina? You should have that thing out in your backyard. <laughs> Glad to have you on, Larry. So what time is it there? Is it 9 p.m. roughly? 
Boy, you Phoenix people, you have warmer, warmer skies, clearer skies, I bet. 14 people on at midnight Eastern time. That's crazy. Well, this is the ugliest picture of M51 I've ever seen in my life, but at least now we can see the spiral arms and we can see some of this dark, uh, dust lane in between the spiral arms. We're at 15 minutes and I think we're going to stop. But we're going to blame part of this on moonlight, part of it on atmosphere, and maybe come back to this later. So let's, in our observation here, let's say we could finally make out dust lanes Boy, was it ugly. We figured part of it was due to the 87% moon, part because it's only up 20 degrees. Uh, and we wondered if we were imaging into some leaves, though our ASI 178 says no. Um, either way, it's ugly. We're going to leave it at that. This is not the best shot. I wonder if it's tuning. Uh, okay. GSM test is closing the observatory, so he must be um, remote observing too. Ah, uh, cloud cover in Phoenix. Well, then I'm not as uh, uh, filled with resentment for for Phoenix tonight. Simon T, good to have you aboard. Uh, if you guys think I should be doing something better with this histogram, just tell me because as far as I can tell, with 17 minutes of data, that's the best we're going to do on a, an 87 percent moonlit night. At least you can see the interacting galaxies. This is, uh, what was that called again? NGC 5195. Let's do an observation there just because it's easy. Um, our view was ugly, but we could definitely see how NGC 5195 is pulling M51 apart at the seams. Okay. One last live view. You know what? I think that would come in if we gave it enough time. Right, Curtis. Good to have your board, Curtis. It looks really green. Well, see, that's where your color vision is better than mine. Is that better? I am red-green colorblind, so most of my color matching is done by um, calibration instruments rather than by <laughs> actual perception. I was in a colorblind test way back when I was six years old, let alone now. Also, this tuning. You know, I'm curious also about flats. We're running flats tonight. And it did keep them. And it's a new library of flats. Sending you a link on cloudy nights to my Discord. Thanks, Curtis. You could try increasing the exposure. Would I do that while we were live stacking? Make this 30 seconds. I like that idea. I think that's a good idea, Kim. If you guys uh, weren't familiar with Kim, he's actually sitting down there. And isn't it the outskirts of, oh, Kim, I think it's the outskirts of Sydney, right? Like about 35 miles from Sydney. Mr. Nother, good to have you from Germany, 6 a.m. 
grabbing your first cup of coffee. Thanks for joining us. We're trying to tease M51 at 19 minutes. We just hit 20 minutes. This should be prettier than this. You know what? Instantly, we can see the difference that that 30 seconds is making. Kim, that was a good call. This blue is handicapping us. I'm going to drop that just a little bit. Now look at the way we can now see a lot more of those spirals and see how they're being torn apart. And now we're starting to barely, 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 barely see this bridge between the two. Barely. But it's ugly, guys and gals. Ugly. Adelaide. Boy, that's probably an insult. The new annotate feature. I have not, Brent. Where is this thing? Oh, my goodness, Brent. Thank you. Annotate. Annotate. Where, 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 Brent? Okay, Curtis, we'll do. I don't see annotate. Scripting sequencer. Edit, maybe? Deep Sky Sequence Planner. No, that's editing sequences. Deep Sky. Tools. Histogram. Polar Align. Sensor Analysis. ADC Alignment. Pixel Value Readout. Maybe it doesn't work when you're... Uh, Live stacking, Brent? Because I am not seeing it. Oh, I want to annotate so much. Papa Tech, good night. Oh, wow. Halfway down. Deep Sky Annotation. Go, Brent. Oh my goodness, that is like the coolest thing in the world. What? Boy, that is super ugly though, look at that. This is evidently too high. Those flats are not helping us at all. Boy, look how... The galaxy shows up better. How is this possible, Brent? Is that using the astrometry data? Have you imaged NGC 1579 Northern Triffid? Well, I've certainly been to the Triffid before. Remove them from for now. You think? I was just enjoying it so much, Curtis. Uh, I would need to make a note of this. How I remember to go back to NGC 1579. We will do that, Green Cat. It knows the positions after a plate solve. I see. You know, I'm going to disconnect these flats. But I think I have to wait till after we finish this live stack, right? So let's finish it. 24 minutes, that's enough. But look, now if you just look at that section only, just focus on only that section. I'm like the Wizard of Oz guy again. Ignore the man behind the curtain. Now we're starting to see M M51 the way I think we want to see it. It does give us hope that if we stayed 
long enough. Boy, it's still ugly, though. Atmosphere, moonlight. Where does Sharp Cap get the data from? From the plate solving? Yeah, I think. Oh, he think re remove the flats. I see. Okay, I'll do that. So I can take them off during a live stack? Let's try this. Let's see. Next time we end a frame, let's see if that. Oh, so it's not that much better. Not at all better. Boy, it doesn't look like it's making that much difference. I guess maybe because a lot of this is maybe moonlight and just poor color matching and stuff, I think. Let's get rid of that for a minute. Man, if we get rid of that, we lose all the color of the galaxy, though. Yeah. We are starting to bring in the galaxy. Look at that. Now let's zoom maybe at um, 75. Such faint galaxies are not an F2's best friend. <laughs> You're probably right, Mr. Nother. Probably does a plate solve and connects to a database. External data file added to the app. You can add your own data with a CSV file. That's cool. Could be Moonlight. Crop it. That looks better. Crop it more. So only galaxy is frame, basically. Gotcha. Okay, that's what we'll do. But I don't like this. I guess that's just part of observing with an 80% moon. Okay, I'm going to go ahead and do a snapshot of this just to remember the ugliness. And save that as uh, in... Um, Desktop, Sharp Cap Captures, M51. Um, hmm, I don't have a single other M51 in this newer set of files. M51 dash 2022 dash 01 14 dash 28 minutes, dash 77 frames at 30 seconds at 100 gain. Okay. Not one of our best targets, to be honest. 87% moon, though. Let's remember that. Okay, let's stop the live stack. If the F2 were 30 degrees, it'd be okay. 30, 30 degrees above the horizon? Mr. Another, yeah, laugh out loud, correct. Okay. Uh, let's change our sequencer back to the um, next target. And let's go over to the, look at that. You can see it at the high gain setting at three seconds. That's phenomenal. <laughs> Might be able to see more by using a higher gain and so M52, let's slew there. Let's bring our, um, 178 into the 
forefront. Let's put the scope down there in the lower right so you can see the scope slew and the 178 talking about focal length, not degrees, 30 inches. Oh. <laughs> gotcha. Oh, yeah, that is 30 inches. Good point. Okay, so you can see where we're aiming now. This is Cassiopeia here. That W shape. There's Polaris. And again, Ursa Major here. So we're kind of aiming somewhere here in this moonlight. Is that, I can't see, is that Taurus? Let's go over to our, minimize the window in front of the planetarium software. Let's back off. Kind of have to click on it first before it picks up this keystroke. Let's get the constellations for a second. Perseus. Perseus. Andromeda is off to the left there. And Cepheus is off to the right. So this is M52. Look at that. There's this, uh, what is that called? The, is that called the Bubble Nebula? NGC 7635. Let's actually center on a star maybe right here. That way it'll move down and maybe we can get two for one special, right? Yeah. So hopefully that framed it up for us. NGC 7635. In that moonlight, I don't know if it'll show up, but let's M52 is looks like an open cluster. That should be pretty visible. But look at that moon. It just looks like the sun, doesn't it? A lot of glare. You're right, Curtis. Try objects on the other side of the sky from the moon. You're right. Mr. Nother, by the way, I just ordered my new scope to complete my EAA setup. Can't wait for it to be delivered. Okay, Mr. Nother. Everybody in, are you in, I forget, Germany? No, where are you? It's going to have clouds. In fact, we might have clouds all over the world if you do that. Tell us what your scope is. And meanwhile, let's go over here. Let's switch to our auto and switch to our next target. So it starts the live sequence, the live stacking for us. It uh, sets the game to to um, oh rats! I did next target. I meant to do start imaging. It sets the gain to one hundred. It um, sets the exposure to 20 seconds and it clears the live stacking for us and then it starts live stacking so it's really valuable if we can remember to use that sequencer really uh, handy stuff mr another what kind of scope did you order oh yeah it's good we'll let that do another frame and then we'll start playing more with this See how we're, we're getting both targets here. So this is M52, this open cluster. While that's collecting, let's go read about M52 for a second. Minimize the window in front of M52. It's kind of a hassle sometimes to find it. But if you can't find it, you can always go right click, select other. And if there's something else there, you can just go like that. And then it'll select it for you. And then when you right click it, it's live. Open cluster. Um, now with that live, let's try to go back over to where our live stacking is happening. And boy, 
when you pump those mids up, that. It's strange, isn't it? We can actually get rid of all that discoloration. And see, we're still picking up a little bit of this target here. It's that NGC, yeah, the bubble nebula, NGC 7635. Now I can change this to M52 while we're imaging. That's a nice feature in the latest sharp caps, isn't it? Look at this double double deal we're getting. You think that's because of this? Let's go up here under tools and look at this uh, deep sky image annotation again. Mount has moved too far from plate solve location. Please solve again. Uh, you got a plate solve after you get there. Yes, 75 to get it to F6. Now that I know about the moon, I'm not sure the flats are the issue. Oh. It's uh, 10 degree uh, RC. How do you say that? R ro Koshien. I just ordered my new, or no, um, with a Sesto Senso Focuser. You know, I tried that on this uh, Rasa and it, it wouldn't fit. I had to send it back. And I won and a 533. MC Pro. Wow, that sounds like a great. So it's a truss truss version of the Ro Roberto Corsian. <laughs> um, okay, so we got to turn this tool off and remember to to plate solve every time. Um. M52, so that's this cluster here. A nice open cluster containing several hundred stars. The brightest star in view is an eighth magnitude orange star, which is not a true cluster member. So that must be this. Let's zoom in and see that orange star just for fun, since we can. Maybe this or that, maybe. Doesn't belong. It's just a star, a star in the same line of sight. Infantry is easily spotted binoculars. The telescope accentuates this cluster's fainter members. All these little tiny members. Um, the bubble nebula is a mere 34 minutes. Or does that mean seconds? That would be seconds. 34 arc seconds away, and both objects can be glimpsed in the same field of view. Let's go wide for a second, and let's enjoy one more view of this, and let's do our um, observation of this. Um, nice little cluster with, indeed, lots of faint member stars. Uh, now, Let's go down to this bubble nebula. So let's go back over here and go to 100, or maybe start at 66, 50 maybe, and go down and then over till we get that in the center of our view, and then come in and move this over there some, perhaps. Hmm. Boy, let's start the color balance over. That actually is better. I like the machine color balance tonight, because now we can move this over here Moonlight. Richie Crescien. Richie Crescien. Cool. 
Wow, we look forward to seeing that. A, a truss version of a 10-inch Richie Christian. That sounds really good, Mr. Another. Okay, we're at uh, six minutes on this bubble nebula. Let's go find the... I'll minimize the screen in front of Starry Night Pro. NGC 60, NGC 76. Where do you have to go to get that? I'm just going to use the select other that and then say show info. LBN 549 is a diffuse nebula. Huh. Nebulae are giant clouds of dust and gas. They fall into three major types. Well, that's kind of a... Can we... Um... Does it not have info on NGC 7635? NGC 7635, it does show info. There we go. Um, also known as a bubble nebula, is an emission nebula in Cassiopeia located 12,000 light years from the sun. This is a large and extremely faint nebula, a serious challenge for visual observers it requires an extremely dark sky, averted vision, and a narrow band nebula filter. We do not have dark skies. We're running the Celestron light pollution filter, which would have worked for us. You know what else, as I think about this, let's back off for a second. This is in the direction of the Louisville Light Dome. Yeah, that's directly toward Louisville Light Dome. So th there's a lot of light in that sky. And in a normal night, let alone when there's not, see all this light here? That's just the Louisville light dome, sadly. So then you add in the 87% moon, it's no wonder we're getting a very, I will show it on one of the next Zoom sessions, probably added also the EAA rig picture thread in cloudy nights. So we'll look forward to seeing it. GSM test, can the contrast be reduced? You know, sharp cap probably does let you reduce contrast, but I don't ever play with it. That's under image controls, isn't it? No. I don't even know where contrast is. If if sharp cap even has contrast, Enhancement? I don't think we've played with contrast much. Have we guys, other guys who use sharp cap? I don't think there is much of a... I think we're just dealing with Louisville light pollution plus the the 87% moon. Anyway, this is where the bubble nebula would be. You can see a lot of the nebulosity, but just a shade of the bubble. I'm just going to do, see this is NGC. NGC 7635 NGC 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 7635 on uh, 
10 minutes uh, with 20 second exposure and 100 gain. Still kind of striking, even though it's not very bubbly. I think it doesn't. You can change contrast at your monitor as EAA is for observation purposes. I think you're right, Mr. Nother. All right, we're going to stop this live stack. I'm going to save this as seen just to be able to look at it later. And so that was M52. Let's go back to our minimize the window. Oh, I know what I wanted to try. I wanted to try this uh, asteroid tonight. And help me remember is it 19 no, 7482. 7482. So the first thing let's do is let's just check and make sure it's up for the northern hemisphere. 7482. It is up. So now let's go to Horizon, JPL Horizons. Yes, it is quite a small object. Well, that's nice of you to encourage. Um, let's go to JPL Horizons and look up the the ephemerides, whatever it's called. JPL Ephemeris Horizons seventy four eighty two, and let's put the time. So this again is ssd.jpl.nasa.gov slash horizon slash app dot html pound sign. Uh, let's put the time as now. So that'll be um, 12.30 on the 14th. Let's make it 12.35. 12.35 a.m. And let's say 14th until 12.55. That won't be right, will it? It's not 12.55. Is it, or do we put zero, zero, since it's military time? Do we put zero, zero, 30, 35 to zero, zero, 55 with one minute increments, generate the F, ephemeris you need to enter UT thank you Kim for that reminder <laughs> uh, Mr. Another what would it be UT <laughs> is it four hours uh, current time UCT 532 a.m. so let's go to Five thirty five to five fifty five. Thanks, Kim. Camera was removed a while back and changing image controls during a stack.